good morning and welcome to St. John's today. Just as a reminder for those of you who might want a double dose of worship today, we have some special musical guests octave with us in the 11 o'clock service. So we'll celebrate with them here, but we are glad you are here for this service. We'll get to hear Blake at both services, who's not nervous at all, right? No. No, good. All right, so we're going to hear from Blake this morning and looking forward to hearing a little bit from his story. He has chosen for us uh, as our call to worship uh, Psalm 23, and we're going to do the entire psalm, so I just invite you to quiet and seal your heart and hear these words of encouragement this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And we thank you that even today, Lord, in your word, in testimony of your power, in prayer and in praise, we get a taste, a foretaste of that day we see you in your house face to face. Bless this time of worship now, in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everybody. Let's turn to 234, and you do want a double dose of worship because you are going to really enjoy the group octave. So come back at 11 o'clock. We're going to sing all four verses of Crown Him with Many Crowns. to 505 <clears throat> and let's sing verse 1 and then let's sing verse 3 of love lifted me
we celebrate the love of Christ. I'm so glad to see all of you here today. It's been just such a beautiful weekend. Hope you've been able to enjoy God's magnificent creation. If you are a guest, a newcomer, if you're joining us online, welcome. We're so glad you chose to worship with us this morning. Please let us know how we can best serve you. Let's take a few moments to greet one another. And children, you can come forward for children's time. friends, I have a question for you. Oh, come on down. I have a question for you. Now, what would happen if you went a very, very long time, let's say weeks, months, whatever it might be, without ever cleaning up, without taking a bath or a shower? How, how would you smell? Stinky, right? Oh, no, we, we don't want that. So let's imagine in this purely hypothetical scenario that you go a long time without washing, and I said, I know what will solve all the problems. Here's a piece of gum, all right? Here's a piece of gum, so it'll help your breath smell better. Would that fix the issue? No. You little stink bugs, you need to go uh, take a shower, take a bath, get all washed up, and sometimes... That's how we view our sin, our sin nature as humans. You know, uh, the Bible says we've all uh, sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, with that sin, the world offers a lot of quick fixes. Try this, try that, try that religion, do that practice, have fun here, have fun there. Trying to give you a quick fix on the ultimate issue. Well, ultimately, we know as Christians the only thing that can save us is who? Who is the only one that can save us? God, amen. Uh, Jesus is the only one who can save us. And he uh, came to earth, died on the cross for our sins. And if we believe and trust in him alone, we'll have eternal life and we'll get to live with him. The quick fixes, they don't work, do they? And so this week, as you you go out and, and do your thing, remember the love of God, the love that lifted us, And let us lean closer to Jesus. I'm going to pray, and then you can head back to your seats, okay? Heavenly Father, Lord, we lift these uh, children up, Lord. Be with them, guide them, protect them. Help us as a church to uh, nurture them and walk alongside them, Lord. Help us to set good examples. Help us to always lean on you, rely on your wisdom, not our own, and not look to the world for quick fixes that don't ultimately deal with the problem, Lord. We rest in what you've done on the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Is there returning to their seats? Just uh, you can turn your attention to the back of your order of worship for things happening this week and in the coming coming weeks here at St. John's. Of course, uh, if you're ever looking for a way to get connected, we have our Wednesday night classes, Sunday school as well, but our Wednesday night classes, which change and they rotate through the seasons, but you have those for the spring um, on the back of your order and you can take a look at that and other ways to get connected there as well. Of course, we want to continue to bring your attention to May 4th and May 5th. May 5th, of course, is the Sunday, the Sunday celebration of our 150th anniversary. And again, uh, on your way out, if you didn't get the the formal invitation on the way out, you can find these. Please take one of those, whether for your family or if there is someone that you've wanted to invite to St. John's for a while or someone who uh, hasn't been perhaps in a while and needs to be reminded, please take that and, and share that with them. It's a great time to have someone come uh, celebrate with us at St. John's as we celebrate ultimately not ourselves, but what God has done in and through us, and we are excited to celebrate that day. And of course, an opportunity to reconnect uh, for our 150 on May 4th out at, at Ledger's, and again, that, will, that, that part will be Dutch Street. We'll have plenty of food for you on Sunday. But if you want to connect with any of our out-of-town guests on that uh, Saturday evening, we'd love to, for you to join us uh, for dinner that night. So please, um, please let us know in the office that you're going to be a part 
of that. And of course, now we're going to turn our attention to God's Word. I'm going to invite Trent to come and lead us in that. Trent. If you will turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 5. Uh, today we will be looking at uh, the, the man Naaman. And Naaman was a great warrior who was healed of leprosy. And it's just a great reminder of how the Lord not only heals us spiritually, but sometimes He meets all of our needs. So again, 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 19. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands of raiders from Aram have had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel. And she, she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me? to be cured of his leprosy. See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard what the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned. And went off in rage. Naaman's servants went to, went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the men of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all of his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. The prophet answered, As surely as the Lord lives whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. If you will not, said Naaman, please let me your servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifices to any other god but the Lord. But may the Lord forgive your servant for this one thing. When my master enters the temple at Rimen to bow down, and he is leaning on my arm, and I have to bow down there also, when I bow in the temple of Rimen, may the Lord forgive your servant for this. (coughs) Go in peace, Elijah said. This is the word of the Lord.
time, if you'll join me as we affirm our faith with the Apostles' Creed. If you need a little bit of help, you can find it right on the front inside cover of your hymnal. declare that there is no God except for you. So we lift our eyes to you this morning and we ask, Lord, that you would heal our hearts, heal our hands, and heal our minds, and we would use them all for your glory. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated, and as you are seated, if you will open up your hymnal to page 529 for our hymn of preparation.
And Father, may these words that we lift in song find their way to the depths of our hearts that we might truly, truly, truly love you and love you with all of our hearts and to love you with the entirety of our lives. And Lord, as we love you, we pray too that we will become a people who not only love you, but look to those around us, seeing their pain, to love them as well, Lord, that your love might reach them through us. We pray for this, mindful of the pain that we feel even this week, and we pray as we've celebrated and mourned in, in remembering in the lives and sending off the lives of Pam Hagen and Pam Key. We pray for their families, even as we pray for their friends, and even as we pray for our own souls as we think about that day that we will um, come before your judgment throne. Lord, we're mindful that we live in a world that feels like it's on the verge of World War III, wondering if, in retrospect, that's what these days will be defined of, as, as if the conflicts escalate even more. And so we pray for the peace of Israel, yes, but for peace for their neighbors, peace China and her neighbors, Ukraine and Russia and her neighbors, our South American neighbors. Lord, we know that you do feel our deepest woe. And yet, Lord, we know that you are the only one who can fill that woe. And so even as we are gathered in this place, giving you thanks for the many joys we have, but for those who have gathered today, fill the void with your love. Fill our hearts with you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we do want to be mindful that as we come to the Lord with our requests, as we come to him for the um, things we need, so also we come to him in thanksgiving. We come to him in celebration and great gratitude. And so we take time now to give back in a continued spirit of thanksgiving through our prayers and through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
with joyful hearts, Lord, we give you thanks, we give you praise, and we thank you that you hear not only our prayers of supplication, but you hear our praises, you hear our thanksgivings. And we even ask now that you would receive these humble gifts from us and that you would take them, use them, multiply them for the sake of your name, for the sake of your glory and the building of your church and your kingdom. And we do indeed, in these purposes, consecrate them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. One of the greatest responsibilities of the church is, help, is to help raise up the next generation in the faith and to help raise up the next generation of Christian leaders. And here at St. John's, we do that in different ways. We have Little Lambs led by Tina, our children's ministry led by Stephanie, our youth ministry led by Trent, and then we also have a young adult Sunday school led by Blake and Corey. One other way that we seek to fulfill that responsibility of raising up the next generation of leaders is through our, uh, internships here at St. John. So, for example, I was a church intern at 2018, and uh, I'm still here. So, on one hand, it turned out well, unless you don't like me, and then maybe it turned out too well, and you're like, darn Yankee, go back from whence you came. But uh, it looks like I'm here to stay uh, from, from the sound of it. But anyways, uh, for the last nine months, uh, it's been a joy and an honor to have Blake as our church intern. He served in a couple different ways, a youth, youth group and young adult ministry, and he is part of the liturgical elements here during the services. And as one of the major highlights of his internship, he'll be sharing his testimony today. I do want to be clear, this is not his last day as intern, so a testimony and then he bolts. No, he'll still serve as our church intern. Uh, however, this was one of the major highlights, and we're very excited about that and very thankful for Blake and all the different ways he served. He has such a joyful heart, such, a, such an energy to help others. And so what we'll do now is we're going to pray for Blake to help him prepare for the giving of his testimony. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we lift up uh, Blake and the words he is about to share, Lord, and we recognize that our story, our testimony is but a piece of your larger story of how you love us and how you take care of us and the larger story of the love you showed us through Jesus Christ. So give Blake clarity, calm his nerves, help him to speak confidently, Lord. We're so thankful for him and uh, all, all those who help to serve here at St. John's we are so richly blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, it's here. I didn't think it would get here as fast as it did, but I'm very grateful and honored to share my testimony with all of you today. I hope that through this testimony that you won't see me up here, but you will be able to see the great things that God has done for my life and the great things that he is willing to do for your life. And I know I'm not as good looking or speak as well as these two fine men over here, but hopefully, <laughs> hopefully. God, that hurt my John. The title of my testimony is called No Way, Yes Way, Always his way. No way. There is no way I could ever be that person. That very sentence has echoed in my head for many years now. No way. It was always the way in which I wanted to live my life. No way but my way. Growing up, I would say I was blessed. I had two loving parents. We always had more than enough. I had both sets of grandparents who loved me very dearly. I had extended family who were always warm and welcoming. I say all this to say that I did not lack in being loved. I also did not lack in being surrounded by God's love. My entire family was rooted in Christian life. If it was a Sunday, it was almost guaranteed that we were at church. I knew about Jesus. I knew about sins. I knew about heaven and hell. And there was no way I was going to hell, I thought as a young kid. I wanted Jesus. But as I got older, I experienced what most men will encounter in their life. Pornography. 
it was unusual because some people discover it as teens or as adults, but I found it when I was a kid. I thought, no way will I let this come between me and the Lord. And unfortunately, I would choose a life of self-indulgence rather than indulge in the goodness of God. Fast forward a bit, and I'm in high school, struggling with lust, identity, and my relationship with God. It seemed to me the older that I was getting, the more I was running away from him. I stopped going to church as much. My prayer life was lackluster, and my love for him was growing dim. Fast forward years later, and you'll find me on my hands and knees, tears streaming down my face in a Walmart trailer, wishing that I was never born. I was 22 at the time, and I should be living it up right now. No way should I be this miserable, but I was. This no way, my way attitude became my biggest downfall. Along the way, I began to stray further and further from God. I began to take advantage of the good things he had done for me and use them to destroy my witness to him. First, it started with relationships. I began to put people in God's place because I wanted their approval over God's approval. I would need to have their validation in order for me to feel validated about myself. In turn, I would become this narcissistic monster who only cared about my needs and not theirs. This would, blend, this would then bleed over into family relationships, which would turn into screaming matches, which would then leave me with resentment and hatred for my family. The same family who did everything they could to pour as much love into me as they could. Next came the excuses. My relationship was falling apart at the seams, and instead of admitting that I was the problem, I chose to blame everyone else. I even began to blame God. As I kept growing in this self-centered lifestyle, I began to make worse decisions that kept digging me into a deeper hole. Some were financial mistakes. Some were relationship mistakes. Some were putting things into my body that didn't belong, such as steroids. I stopped going to church. Pornography was my new best friend, and I moved out of my house into a home of a girlfriend at the time. But my biggest mistake, the one where it all came crashing down, was when I said, I don't need God. I thought if there was a God, there was no way he was for me because he was the one responsible for my life going to shambles. I thought if he truly loved me, where was he? How foolish and blind my thoughts were at this time. Once I said no to God, I was faced with a new struggle, death. I clung to the idea of heaven for so long because it gave me peace that one day I would have joy unspeakable and would not have to worry anymore. But now that God was out of my life, my thoughts and my logic told me there was nothing after this. The wave of anxiety crashed over me and thrashed me back and forth in its waves. I was officially at rock bottom. Depression was my friend, anxiety was my wife, and suicide was my way out. I remember I attempted to end it all twice, once by hanging, and another with a gun. I backed out those two times because something inside me in those moments were screaming, no way, you can't do this. I have plans for you. Flash forward a bit and we're back at that Walmart trailer. I watched a video about an atheist having a near-death experience and through that experience he came to know Jesus. It was the way he talked about Jesus the love that he felt coming from Jesus. And in that moment, in my searching for Jesus, he met me in my time of need. I didn't physically see him, nor was this supernatural phenomenon that took place. I just felt this overwhelming peace come over me, this burning inside my heart, and this small voice inside my head saying, here I am. I love you. Come rest in my arms. Though I was the only one in that trailer, I truly felt those arms wrap around me. And in that moment, I said no way to my way. And I said yes way to Jesus. I was saved right then and there. So what happened after that? Well, it went a little something like this. 
When I started talking to Jesus, I said, there's no way I'll ever be accepted in a church. God said, yes way. And he showed me his way. He put Glenda Earwood in my path. I came to St. John's one Sunday to visit, and Glenda walked right up to me, shook my hand, and said she was so happy to see me. She then proceeded to sit next to me the entire service, and after that, she told me these words, I see something in you, and I think you could be a great influence for someone she knew. Then she proceeded to invite me to lunch with her family. This sweet woman did not know me, but her kindness touched my mending heart in a way that made me say, I think I can make this place my home. A short while later, I joined the church. When I said, God, there's no way I could ever become a deeper believer. I just don't understand the Bible that well. God, in his way, brought Rev. John and Nathan Williams, whose unique styles of delivering the word of God opens my heart to the word in ways I could never imagine, building within me a confidence to go and share the word with others. When I said, there's no way I could overcome these anxieties and these doubtful thoughts, God said, yes way, and brought me my mom and dad. Mom, with her gentle nature, would always come for me and pray these beautiful prayers in times when I would just tremble. A reflection of God on how he holds us in our time of need. My dad, with his warrior-like spirit, would say, get up and face this thing, for you are stronger than it, and you won't have to face it alone. A reminder of when God tells us to have courage and to not be afraid, for he is always with us. He also sent me two built-in best friends, my baby sisters, Heather and Bailey Tietro, who remind me that you're never too annoying for God. When I thought there was no way I could begin to understand what a lifetime of Christianity would look like, God in his way brought me my mama and papa, whose lifetime of service to God and years of gaining wisdom from him allowed them to pour into me and begin to set in motion my lifetime of service to him. When I thought there was no way I could ever beat some temptations and addictions that would try to creep back into my life, God in his way brought me Shane Guest, who always reminds me that we can lay our burdens down at God's feet, that we never have to fight alone. Many calls, sometimes late night calls, fishing trips, or just sitting in his garage reminded me as well that godly friendships come in all shapes and sizes, kind of like soft plastic worms. Love you, Pookie Bear. When I said there was no way I could ever have long-lasting friendships that would be God-centered, God once again showing me that his way was better brought me Isaac, Zeke, Chloe, Mariah, Nate, and Justin. And for those of you who don't know Justin, he's been my best friend for almost 11 years, and he never once gave up on me. He walked through me through this whole journey, and I'm forever grateful to have him in my life. When my life was going good, they celebrated with me the victories and always reminded me to give back to God. When life went downhill, they stuck by my side, reminded me always to turn back to God, ready to pick me up when I had fallen so hard. They were patient and kind. They loved me because that was the values that God had instilled in them and they are a huge part of the reason why I'm here today and why my relationship with God is as strong as it is. And to add more to that, I would have never met any of them if it hadn't been for God stepping in and sending Christy Guest into my life. She showed her love and kindness and invited me to join a Wednesday night Bible study class where I met all those wonderful people. When I said there was no way I could ever have a godly relationship with someone that I would want to build a future with, God made a way and sent Faith Guest. For most of my life, my love life was absolutely abysmal. If my sisters ever brought someone who acted like I did back then home, he would never make it through the front door. There was no way I thought I could ever be that kind of a man that a godly woman would want. But as God changed my heart, he brought faith into my life, literally and physically. She taught me so much about what it means to, take God, to make God the center of everything you do. She truly affects the peace and the hope and the love that Jesus gives us in her day-to-day -day life. It is truly a gift to be able to have someone like her in my life that not only I get to grow closer with, but also get to grow closer to God with as well. And each day is spent making sure that our relationship is giving back to the one 
who not only made it possible, but the one who we both love the most and letting him guide us in each and every step of the way. So that's my life. And when I reflect on it, I couldn't help but notice this common theme. Whenever I say there's no way, God always said, yes way, always, his way. It reminds me of Peter's story. We know that Peter loved Jesus and had intense faith. And just a disclaimer, I'm not saying I, I'm like Peter or want to be like Peter. But there are parts of Peter's story that are very relatable to my story. But just like how in the beginning when my faith in Jesus was not quite developed, we see Peter with the same like faith. He loves Jesus, but he doesn't see the bigger picture. When I deny Jesus and try to walk my own path, I'm reminded of the three denials that Peter uttered from his mouth. I do not know him. When I laid there in that trailer and I gave my life to Christ and told him that I would say yes to anything he had for me, I'm reminded of John 21, 15 through 19, where we see Peter reinstated. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, Son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt. Because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and went went where you wanted. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God, then said to him, follow me. After all Peter had done, Jesus was there to bring him back, and he built Peter up. Three times we see Jesus in verse 16 through 18 ask Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. And then after those three times, he ends it with follow me. I love God, and each and every day I take a breath, I'm reminded of his grace. He never gave up on me. He never hid himself from me. He was my fourth man in the fire, time after time. That's the God I serve, the one who makes the impossible possible, the one who makes a way when there's no way. And as Rev. John put it, He's the same God who took the worst we could do to him and made it the best he could do for us. He rescued me from that grave I had buried myself in, dusted me off, and is building me up for something bigger and better than I could ever imagine. So if there's anything I want to leave you with, it's this. Give your life to Jesus. Follow him. Love him. Let him take your no ways and change them into yes way. Always. His way. And Lord, as we come to you now, we pray, God, that we know that you are always good. That your ways are always the best way. Lord, I would like to take a moment now for you to hear us, God. For anyone that's in here that wants to commit themselves to a lifetime of serving you. Or like me, want to get back on that path and recommit themselves. Or just take time to examine and reflect on their faith. God, we know you hear our prayers and we know you hear our cries. You were always there. You're the good shepherd. 
You give us joy, peace, hope, and love unspeakable. Lord, I pray, Lord God, that you would hear the prayers of our congregation, Lord, and you begin to move in the lives of those who need, who need you the most, God. For those who said yes to following you, God, we ask that you would just begin to build into them a foundation to guide their hearts, to choose the right choices that will glorify you and your kingdom, God. Lord, we pray all these prayers, but there is none prayer sweeter than the one that Jesus taught us as we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you.